The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the BS Report. A murky day here in Southern California. Not murky for the listeners because we are back after an eight-day hiatus. Had to go to New York, do some stuff. Uh, and Joe Mead won't let me record podcasts on my hotel phones. So blame him. Anyway, we're back. And on the Subway Fresh Tech Hotline. A guy that I will be writing with on the website that we are uh, both involved with and launching off of ESPN in a couple months. Chuck Klosterman, what's happening? Why is it murky in Los Angeles? It's murky. It's a murky day. Are you actually day. underwater? <laughs> it's, it's a grayish day. It's a gray mm. day mm. here. But not as bad as the weather that I had in New York City where it rained almost every day. Um, let's, talk, let's talk hoops first because... Well, we disagree on everything, but this college pro thing, we really, really disagree on. Now, I had a big a real, win. a real wedge in our relationship. It really is. It's a good way. It keeps it fresh, though. But um, the Monday title game kind of vindicated everything I had been saying about how bad that product is. Now, you, you're going to argue that it was an aberration, but the point you is... Don't it, you don't think it was an aberration? You think that Butler typically goes three for 28 or whatever they do, you think it's an accurate reflection of how they normally play? I think when you have a system that most of the best guys leave after one or two years and now we're in this grind of basically anybody who's one of the top 40 teams can make the finals. And now you're in a dome. There's 80,000 people. The lighting, the lighting background's weird. There's a ton of pressure. There's 25 million people watching. And you have the 40th best college team or the 32nd best college team or whatever, and they're in that environment. Odds are the game's going to stink. I don't. I don't know. If, I don't. I mean, I can't argue that that was some great play game. That's true. You know, it, it, uh, it, it was weird to watch. It was clear that, particularly in the second half, Butler was really inside their own head. Right. And they were uh, they were just they they thought that it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen for us now. It's not going to happen tonight. Uh, I, when, when a team like that is missing layup after layup, though, you sure. can't really say that that has much relationship to how they normally play basketball. I mean, that, I mean, you say I'm going to argue it's an aberration, but it certainly was. And I mean, the fact that you think this vindicates your argument, well, okay, how much? How, how, how fast did things change in your mind? In 2008, Kansas played Memphis. It was this great championship game. It yep. wasn't that long ago. No. It was a high level of play. Last, now, last was year wasn't bad. Game last night. So you're kind of like the guy who wakes up and it's snowing and he says, oh, see global warming? It doesn't exist. It's snowing. <laughs> how can there be, how can the planet be warmer if it's snowing in April? You know? I think the problem is last year when Butler made it, they had Hayward, who was a, who was a lottery pick who I watched last night towards he the Lakers. He looked great last night at the end, didn't he? Yeah, he was good. He was a real player. That was somebody, I think when you get in a situation where you don't have you know, you can have these Cinderella stories in college hoops, which is great. The VCU thing was great. The Butler thing was great. But there gets a level. You get to a level, which we saw at the Final Four, where at some point you're going to need you're going to need the big Kahuna. You're going to need at least one guy who you know is is the franchise guy or whatever. And VCU didn't have a guy like that. They stunk in that game. Butler didn't have a guy like that on Monday night. They stunk like. And it goes back to the whole thing with college hoops. Like, these guys, you know, Kentucky has a starting five last year and a starting five this year that had no correlation to one another. That's you know, and, and I don't think a team that has had these, has done the one-out strategy, have they? has a team won the title doing that yet? It does not seem to be a system that works. The idea of, like, a, going out and finding the best high school senior who you know is going to leave it yeah. seemed like it was going to be the most viable strategy for a while. But, I mean, when you look like, you know, guys like Michael Beasley and Durant and all these players who have done that, it has not – it just hasn't worked. 
Uh, if, well, Butler, you... if Butler plays anything close to their normal game, if they shoot 38% from the hmm. field, they win. It's an interesting game then. Uh, if, uh, I mean, it was just, it was a really strange situation that kind of perpetuated itself as it went on. I thought it was interesting, too, that the announcers felt this strange obligation to apologize for right. what we were watching. I mean, as if we or they had anything better to do. I mean, yeah. I mean like, Seth Davis was at halftime when he was sort of like, this is awful, this is an awful performance. Like, he's going to go to architecture school now. I mean, he should be <laughs> he should be happy it exists at all. Right. So where do you stand on the one-year, two, two-year thing? Or three-year? Where year? do I stand like, on it? Well, I think that the way it is in college football, where these guys have to be out of high school for three years, certainly makes that product better. I mean... I would. I wish it was the way it used to be. I wish it was very. I, I wish it was very uh, unique when a guy left early, and it was. It was almost controversial when they did. Yeah. I think that would certainly make things better, but it's just a hard law to enforce. It's, I, I. I feel even the way it is now. If if someone took the NBA to court, if a player took the NBA to court, I think they would have a hard time arguing that they're justified and limiting when people can be become professional uh but i you know i because what we like about basketball from a entertainment perspective is different you know i like teams like vcu and butler i i I like watching it i i I enjoyed the tournament you know i i think it was a very fun tournament to watch but now it's possible and i was talking about this with another one of our friends the other day it's i maybe have lost my objectivity on this Oh, like, aren't you? I, I, I like have, when you admit I may that. Have liked, I might like college basketball to the point where um, I, I'm not. Uh, maybe maybe what I'm the things I'm seeing in it now aren't real and they're personal to me. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not even sure. You know. I think we need at least two years. You make a really good point, and I've I've wondered about this. I think we even talked about this a little on the podcast, but whether it's constitutional to prevent somebody from earning a living. I don't know how football has gotten away with it. Like if there, let's say there's some stud freshman running back that comes in. He's just incredible. He's Marcus Dupree crossed with uh, Robo Adrian Peterson, and the guy just clearly is better than anyone in college and needs to be in the pros. What right do they have to tell him that he has to stay there for, for another two years legally? Well, am I wrong about this, or did Maurice Claret try this? He did, and, and it didn't and really what work. Happened to, yeah, what happened to the case? It just disappeared. I don't. I mean, I, I I don't know if he committed some crime in the interim, and that's sort of what distracted us from the case happening. But uh, yeah, you're right. I I don't. <laughs> it's funny. I don't know how it was resolved. I think I it, he must have gotten overruled at some point. I, I, well, I'm not even sure it got that far. It was. It was just. I, I just remember the news being that it was going to happen, and then suddenly all these other aspects of his life kind of took precedent. But yeah. It just seems like it's going to help pretty much every college athlete, no matter how good they are, to spend two years in college. And it was Steve Kerr and I talked about this a couple of weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, I listened to that. Yeah. yeah, he was saying like even LeBron and Dwight Howard potentially could have been helped by staying two years and you know being in but, some sort of structure and being coached. And yeah, you know, I was I was thinking about this, but at the same time, I was watching the game last night. And you guys had mentioned Derek Favors. Yep. As an example of somebody who, uh, from a, a real, like, a immediate, from an immediacy perspective, is just not ready to be in the NBA, and he looks to a degree somewhat lost out there. But I was thinking, well, okay, so if he goes to the NBA early, and maybe he's not even playing in the games that much, he's still practicing against a higher caliber of player. He's practicing only against people who would have been great college players. Yeah. So for his actual development, even though they have to go through this period where they look really uncomfortable and really lost, are they not actually playing against better people at a game that's going to be closer to what their intended style of play will be? I remember Mike Dunleavy saying this when when uh, uh, or am I getting his name wrong? Who's the ki- uh, the kids? Mike Dunleavy, right? Yeah. Yeah, Junior. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, I guess they both are. He actually had mentioned that he wished he had come out a year earlier and not played at the pro level, but had basically trained and lived and practiced 
with pro guys. Hmm. Uh, because what you know, I mean, it, it does. Now the question, of course, becomes: Is you know how intense are NBA practices, uh, and you know uh, uh, how much of this has to do with things outside of basketball? And those are kind of more complicated things, but. You know, it would. It certainly. It'd be kind of like this. I mean, what would make a high school kid a better player if he was able to play JV and start, shoot a lot, and score, or as a sophomore he had to just practice with the varsity every day and didn't see any game time? Uh, I think you could make an argument on both sides of that. I think it would depend on what situation the guy went into. Like, you look at Andrew Bynum. You could argue that was a great situation that he went into. The Lakers, Phil Jackson, they have an established star. He, he's he got, by his third year, they had other big guys that, you know, they, they weren't expecting him to play 40 minutes a night his third year in the league. And you watch him this year, especially the last two months, and that guy's been a beast. And I think he's only 24, something like that. But, you know, I whether what if he had gone to... I don't know, Syracuse or Georgia Tech or maybe, well, let's say he went to Georgia Tech because we know they had a bad coach. They just fired him. Favors was at Georgia Tech. He was playing on a team that had a bad coach and no point guards. I don't know if that would have helped him to go back for another year, even though I feel like he needed another year. So, you know, it's almost like it's one of these case-by-case basis things. Yeah, I mean, the Lakers is an ideal situation because Dick Jabbar worked a whole bunch with him too, didn't he? And, yeah. And, I mean, he had, he had pretty good pretty good guidance there. For big guys, it does seem like going to college would, uh, would, would help almost more than the perimeter players. I mean, just in terms of putting a – you know, they would have just this period where they would kind of feel dominant. And when you feel dominant, you get confidence in certain moves, drop step moves, jump up moves, those kind of things. Whereas somebody like Bynum, I think initially, uh, lacked confidence for a while. Yeah. Because he just he, he was going up against players who just seemed, uh, for the first time, as physically as big as him and as quick, uh, and also just way more adept at playing basketball. And I think that maybe slowed his development down. Although now, as it turns out, he's he's basically like you know if if he goes to Georgia Tech, let's say he plays three years there, uh, this would he'd be going into what his second or third year in the NBA now. Right. He would be at about the spot where you would ex- would expect him to start being great, you know. Well, you don't want the Ralph Sampson scenario where the guy has a four-year college career and then a three-and-a-half-year NBA career and then is is pretty much off the map at that point. But Sampson could have yeah. come out at any point in those four years and been a viable NBA player. And if anything, I think being in college probably hurt him. Ideally, he should have come out after one year or two. Yeah, well, he would have been the first pick every year, I think. Yeah, the, when he was a freshman, I believe that was the year Joe Barry Carroll came out. And that I suppose was somebody could argue that he was a you know a guy who had played four years in college is better than a guy who played one year, and so maybe he's the second pick. Um, that was, was the year that the uh, that Red Arback, the Celtics had the number one pick. Yes, and Red Arback was lobbying Sampson. Yeah, and because they Sampson, obviously keep that pick if Sampson comes out. Oh yeah, and Sampson ended up. He decided to go back to school, and Arbach had the famous quote, which now I can't remember, but it was something like, "What do they think? This kid's going to be a doctor? He's seven foot four. He should be in the NBA." Then the next year, uh, which is on YouTube, it's crazy. You can find this. It's Brent Musburger uh, doing this report about this four-team trade that almost went through. It was the year the Lakers had the number one pick, and they ended up picking James Worthy, but. They had this four-team trade in place where basically they would have ended up with the number one and the number two picks. And the reason they were doing that was because Sampson had to decide whether he wanted to come out or not before you know, they had that coin flip or whatever they did that year. Who, were, who would they have been giving up? They would have given up Kareem in the deal. They would have okay, to where? I think he went to – Kareem went to the Knicks. It was like Michael Ray Richardson and – Two other things went somewhere else, and Utah got something. I forget what the parameters were. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. Do you think it would have been to Sampson's uh, benefit had the Rockets not taken Elijah Wan and he had remained a center? Well, it's so hard to say because he got hurt. 
I mean, it, he was Samson was fine until he fell at the Boston Garden and he hurt his back. Then it went to his knees. Like I don't know. I I think that Twin Towers thing. You know, you forget, but back in the day, um, everybody thought that was the direction the league was going because yeah, they the had the two big that. guys. I know they were playing. They were playing Ewing at power forward and stuff. That was yeah, really Celtics really popular thing. Celtics had McHale and, and Parrish, and everybody thought, oh my God, now you need these two big guys, and now the league's gone in a totally different direction. But um, let me ask you this: What if there was a committee and you had twenty people on it of people that were in college basketball and pro basketball? smart NBA fans like ourselves, whatever. They figured out this 20-person committee, and this committee decided on every draft prospect whether they were ready to come into the NBA or not. Totally unconstitutional, but would that be a better system? Uh, would that be a better system? That would be a really unique system, I guess. So you're saying a group of people would just, would dictate who, uh, like the player would have to make his case. Supreme he Court. Ba- he would have to basically have played on the floor, and then perhaps he could petition and say, we have a, a dire financial need in my family or something like that. Like you they- would say you would have to be a top – you'd have to be a lottery pick to enter. Otherwise – the, or the committee would have to say – be a case-by-case basis, and the committee would say – they'd look at somebody like Derrick Rose after his freshman year in Memphis. The committee would look at him, they would evaluate him, and they would say, you know what, Derrick Rose – you're actually ready to come to the NBA now. You might not be ready emotionally, but we've met you, we've interviewed you, you're, you seem like you have a good head on your shoulders, you play hard. It's probably better that you stay an extra year, but if you go to the pros, you're going to be good right away. You're not going to have any you know, weird stuff. Like You're ready. Uh, and Derrick Rose was ready. It, it well, actually seems like a very NBA thing to do because, A, they could argue that it's solely for the benefit of the kids and for their development, and also it would be a great thing for corruption. It would be an extremely easy thing to corrupt, and I think that the NBA would be very drawn to the possibility of furthering and sort of corrupt means of, of working. Because I can just totally imagine some year where, like, uh, uh, some, you know, uh, some franchise that... Uh, uh, is you know on the cusp of being in the lottery and mysteriously no one is allowed to go in the NBA this year or or some years like the Knicks or the Lakers are the number one pick and mysteriously everyone is you know it's good the whiff of corruption you like the whiff of corruption uh, I'm I think maybe that's not a bad idea and maybe that you, you, you don't give them omnipotent power but maybe there should be some sort of committee that every lottery pick could could meet with and talk to and that would give them real advice you know certainly we don't need it this year because there's who, but who look, here's the thing though who who's who are you worry really worried about here are you worried about the fact that these guys leaving early is hurting the college game or that by leaving early it's hurting the pro game or do you feel it's hurting both well here's the thing i think it's hurting both but you could make an argument it doesn't hurt college basketball at all because i i haven't seen I don't think it hurts the ratings. I don't think it hurts um, the money the schools are making. I don't think it really matters whether the guys stay or not. I just think from if you just if you were the czar of basketball and you just looked at this big overall picture and you looked at what's going on, you would try to figure out a way to keep these guys in school where that they didn't feel like they were coming out just for money. Because that's why they come out. They come out just for money. So shouldn't there be some way? You know, the NBA teams could pull together. You get the guy, in a, you know, an insurance policy for the extra college year. There's money that he can't get until he's 40 years old, like an IRA, something like that. Like, it does seem like there are ways that we could make it better for the college kids to make that choice. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, th- I mean, yeah. They, I mean, if they were – if you paid them at all, would that help? Maybe, although you could never pay them enough to make it seem like staying in college was a better financial move. Uh, you know, they, you always hear this, like, you know, last week when there was all this stuff about the NCAA on Frontline and on HBO and stuff. And people like to throw words around, like, incentive. Like, we need to create incentive for these kids to stay in college. Um, and that's like a smart-sounding phrase that is absolutely impossible. There's no way that you can match the incentive of their value on the market, you know, the commercial market of pro basketball. I mean, there's what, what what possible incentive can match that? 
I, I mean, that's been the big story the last two weeks. And I just don't see how you fix that system. You come up with a system when you're trying to deal with that many schools and you're dealing with the male female title nine thing. I just don't see how it's conceivable to fix it. I mean, the, the one I don't part of me, if uh, anybody's had the suggestion, I haven't seen it, but it does seem like maybe we need more divisions in college sports right now. We only have three. You have div one, you have div two, you have div three. Div three is basically NESCAC, Ivy, all the small schools, et cetera. Div two, kind of goes all over the map. And then Div 1, basically everybody just gets thrown into Div 1. Maybe you need to go bigger than that. Maybe you need that top division to only have 40 teams. And, you know, you you take the 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 Pac-10, you take the Big East, you take um, the Big 10, the Big 12, I don't know. SEC, maybe it's maybe you settle at 50 or whatever. And the, the rules are just different for those 50 schools. And if you get recruited by one of them, you get better benefits. Like, well, do you think that would work? I mean, I mean, it, okay, it, it wouldn't, it, like, it wouldn't be a failure because all it would be doing is sort of further moving uh, college sports towards sport, pro sports that they already are essentially. Yeah, you know? which um, they are already. I don't, I don't. I wouldn't want that. I don't. I wouldn't want. That. I don't know if, if. I don't think it would be an ideal system. I don't think it would even necessarily be better than one we have now. So I'd rather keep the current one. But the, I think here's what my thing is. My issue with the NCAA is the fact that they're, they they do a really bad job of explaining why the situation exists as it does. What they should say is is just like you know because their their response is always you know isn't this hypocritical and they're like what hypocrisy I don't think this is hypocritical here they're they're student athletes it's not no hypocrisy what they should say is of course this is totally out of whack it makes no sense that the only people not getting paid are the most important aspect of this system but I think they should just be more straightforward saying it's like. We have all of these other championships and all of these other programs, and if you want these things to exist for people who have no chance to eventually make millions of dollars playing a pro sport, if you're really, if you, if you're at all concerned with the experience they're having in college, that's where this money has to come from. We have to make money where we can, and it's. You know, uh, the, it, it, the salaries that people in the NCAA get paid are kind of obscene. They could easily, uh, you know, fix that problem. They don't need 14 people, you know, uh, at the top of the NCAA uh, sports committee making, you know, they listing their salaries or whatever. That could certainly be pared down. I mean, the, there there should be this idea that, you know, that, some you know, or some random school has a lacrosse program and a swimming program and all these things. And if they want to have good facilities, you got to pay for that stuff, and this is the only way to do it. But I just think the NCA tries to act like people, like they're offended. People think this is crazy. Is it? Could you take her with the scholarships and make it so that every time somebody doesn't graduate, you get a less scholarship, and every time somebody does graduate, you get one and a half scholarships, or something that would incentivize these schools not to go after the one year and out guys for at least for basketball I mean you could I suppose uh, although well, it's not okay so let's say that that there's a, a you, you reward programs for uh, graduating kids by giving them you know giving the program extra scholarships or something everybody would love that you know it'd be really those programs would be you know, talked about on CBS during the tournament, and there would be all these great things. But for the kid who is going to come out for one year and go, it's not like he's going to see this and be shamed into going to Duke or, you know, right. some program. He's still, you know, so then you're going to have this whole other sector of school who uh, is just going to accentuate this. I mean, did, did you see that, that, did you watch that uh, UNLV uh, documentary on Of course. Last week? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I watched um, it. And I thought one of the interesting details about it was that, uh, you know, the people who support UNLV basketball are like people living in Vegas. They, they're not really. They didn't go to the school, yeah. So they have no, they have no sense that like, oh, it's embarrassing if we don't graduate anybody. They just, they, they really saw that as a pro team, and that's what would happen in if you're, what you're describing became the norm. If there was this idea that that you rewarded schools for uh, recruiting a higher caliber of student or whatever, and, and and you rewarded them for graduating, some schools would just feel like, well, we can just go the other way then, and that's how we'll compete. 
And that would be kind of interesting. That would sort of be like, a, like you know, like the black hats and the white hats or whatever. It'd be like a you know, like an old timey uh, good guys bad guys thing. But well, they'd have trouble competing because if they weren't graduating anybody, they wouldn't have any scholarships to give. So uh, eventually, they'd have to recruit okay, people so, that could graduate. But uh, you have to admit, not a bad you idea. Would say, you would say there would be no. You, you, so you would say if you're not, if you don't graduate, you only get a scholarship back if that kid graduates, or a scholarship and a half, or whatever. So if you're UNLV and you you have a team for four straight years from '88 to '92, 1992, and none of the people on that team graduate. You have no scholarships for 1993. You literally can't get anybody. Okay, but what if you what if you recruit the four or five kids who clearly are not going to graduate, and then you recruit six kids whose principal job is practicing and graduating? Good. Do you graduated six kids? You're fifty percent. Yeah, I know, but those those kids weren't really part of the. That, that was sort. That, that that's not. A, is that is that really? How is that helping this problem? <laughs> Helps it a little. How does it help it at all? <laughs> it's basically they're saying we're recruiting five kids we would have never normally recruited, yeah. basically for academic purposes. And then we were recruiting the same kids now, and we don't have any concern about them graduating or anything about their life because we're obviously building sort of this this sort of uh, this two pronged system where we have the players who play for us and the players who study for us. That's not what Duke's doing. Uh, I, I mean, who's not graduating from Duke? Besides Irving's the Irving's going to be gone next year or this year. Uh, he will leave. They knew that when they recruited year. him. That's true. Okay. How about this? If you graduate a kid in three years, not four, a la Kemba Walker and UConn, you get five scholarships. Now you have an incentive to try to graduate all your kids in three years. Well, there'd be a lot of guys majoring in recreation. <laughs> I guarantee you that would happen real quick. You'd have people graduating in three semesters. You know, like, <laughs> when you, uh, I'm sure you, I'm sure you ate up the UNLV doc and the the Fab Five doc. That that whole era. When do you feel like the end of that college basketball era was? I was talking about this with a friend of mine. Like, did it end the day Chris Weber called the timeout? Does that, that college basketball that was- shifted into a little bit something else? And or do you feel like the Kentucky team with Antoine and Tony Delk and McCarty, like that's still part of that era? When did the era sh- end to, and, and go to another era? What are you framing this era as? When you say that era, what do you mean? Like for me, the era goes from, I think, 82. That season with Samson and Ewing and Jordan in the final game and all that. Um, I felt like that was the first year of a new era. And the old era was basically from 77 to 81 and had, you know, when UNLV made their run, or maybe 76 to 81, whatever, but going through Bird and Magic, Phi Slamma Jamma. When was Phi Slamma Jamma? 83 and 84. Oh, so maybe I screwed up my timeline. Yeah, but I don't know what you're framing this era as. What are, you, what are you saying are the qualities of this era? Well, uh, the era would be the glory days of college basketball. When do you feel the glory, like when people like me and they reflect on college hoops, like, oh man, back in the day when we had the Big East every Monday, Chris Mullen was there for four years, and Walter the Truth Barry and Ewing and Pearl Washington, like those were the days. When did those were the days end? Hmm. Well, because I feel like it was 93 was the last and then college basketball kind of morphed and there's still great games like the uh, the 97 national title game is one of my favorites. The one with Miles Simon and Mike Bibby. I think that was 97 um, going against Patino the second. Yeah, 97. There's still great games, but it felt like a different era. Well, I guess there, there is there. There was that period in the late 80s and early 90s because of Michigan and because of Vegas and because of sort of the pro- the, the the real rise to prominence of Duke and Duke, Kentucky. to a degree Arkansas. Duke, Kentucky? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That game, Fab uh, Five. The, uh, I mean, that was, the, you know, when, in that Duke, Kentucky game, though, I mean, that was a, that was like Kentucky playing with all the kids that they had got when they were on probation, it was like sort of a miracle that they were that competitive. I, think, right. if I recall it was like, that was the end of like Richie Farmer and stuff. They had, uh, they had, I mean, they had just started to get some good, like real top flight players again, but the seniors were all these guys who had come kind of from that dark period. Um, 
I mean, those. It's, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that that was the golden era of college basketball because that was also the era when I was most into it, and, and I, I feel like I could be wrong about it, you know, because of my memory. My memory could shift the reality of it. I mean, it would seem as though the years that Indiana went undefeated, if somebody was into college basketball as a teenager then, they would say, like, this is the greatest college basketball to ever been. Well, when um, Bird and Magic's title game was the most yeah. important college basketball game, right? Well, it's the I mean, up to uh, that point. Mo- most important. Well, just like it, most important, I suppose, was uh, push it to push the sport to another level. What? What? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had two, you know, two great players playing against each other. That's because uh, some people it, would argue that when UCLA streak got snapped, or the U- UCLA no- uh, North Carolina State game with David Thompson, Tom Burroughs, and like. Mm-hmm. Like that, those were also you know, fantastic. I think it would be very easy for someone to say that period of college basketball was, I mean, because UCLA was obviously great, and it was everybody against them, and every year it was sort of everyone loading up to play them, and somehow UCLA always managed to win. You know? It reminds me of women's college basketball right now. Um, I, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, uh, I, it would certainly be better for the women's game if uh, UConn had went undefeated again. There's no question about that, you know. I, I, I feel like I feel national interest in the women's game immediately dipped after their loss. Um, the well, but I I still feel like I I got a lot of even friends of mine emailing me about the two final four games on Sunday night, and then last night too. But it feels like it's more in the consciousness, public consciousness, than it was. At least with the people that I know and getting emails and tweets or whatever from readers. I don't remember this happening ten years ago with women's basketball. Well, it, I mean, there well, that uh, there was a concerted effort to have that happen. I mean, you get an issue of Sports Illustrated; they got a big story about the Baylor women's team. You know, yeah. uh, if that that's when you say it's in people's consciousness, I mean, that's sort of what that's what the, like the role of the media is to place things in the consciousness. But it's a more it's a slightly more entertaining product. Like Maya Moore to me is the best college basketball player I've ever seen. I feel like she could at least walk onto a pro team in training camp and last like a week without totally humiliating herself. Uh, it's interesting. I don't know. I haven't, I, I'm not sure if I've seen her play. Maya Moore in UConn? Yeah. I'm not, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if I, I mean, I might have, but I'm not sure if I have, I can't, I'm trying to picture her in my mind right now and I can't do it. I mean, that's just, I'm not trying to be, I mean, I, I'm sure if I watched more women's basketball, I'd probably become a fan, but you can't follow everything. You know, I mean, I don't watch baseball either. You just can't follow everything. Well, just for the record, I don't watch college basketball either or college women's basketball either, but I did watch the, some of the two final four games. And if, a, if a women's college player, I do think we will see it in the next 20 years. I think we will see one of them at least try to make an NBA team. And it's going to be somebody who is a shooting guard somewhere between 6'2 and 6'3. Man, maybe 6'1 and 6'3, who's just a dead eye from 25 feet. So you, you, it would basically be Steve Kerr on the, on the 96 Bulls, like that kind of shooter. And uh, maybe. I mean, there's a lot of evidence against that, but maybe you're right. I don't know. What do you mean? Well, because every time there is a, 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 a like a, oh, there was that dude who wrote that book, uh, uh, like you know, like a, it was like Roger Federer beat me with a frying pan, or some somebody beat me with a frying pan. Basically, right. this guy who did these things where like he played a uh, like a tennis pro, and the tennis pro had to play him with a frying pan. And this guy who I've met, who uh, is like five. I don't know, ten or five nine. He doesn't, you know, but he played a, like a starter for uh, some major college women's basketball team and beat her. And when you see this guy, and you just think of the difference between him and even a mid-level men's college player, I mean, it's, it's, it, it always seems like I'm always hesitant to talk about this because it seems like a criticism of women. It seems sexist or whatever, but it's just a physiology thing. It's just the it's just they're not the same, you know. It's like it's like physically it's different, and unless basketball became a less physical sport, that would it's hard to imagine this happening. And I don't see basketball moving in a direction where physicality is going to matter less. It doesn't seem to be happening to me. I don't. I'm not saying it's somebody that could start in a rotation. I'm saying like let's say you're 
Um, I'm trying to think of a team that's not doing well at the box office. I mean, Let's don't say, even like isn't like UConn and all these schools in Tennessee isn't part of their women's program strength is that they practice against guys. I mean, when I was in college, we used to there was a starting forward on the, on our women's team, and our women's team was good. Like we we made the elite eight one year. Um, she used to play with us, and it was it was not impressive. You know, we we were all kind of like shocked that she wasn't better, considering how how good the team was. But I think things have changed in the last twenty years. But like you brought up Tennessee, let's say ten years from now, Tennessee has some shooting guard who's just an unbelievable shooter. Now you're the Memphis Grizzlies. Your team's not doing well again. You're, you've won twenty four games. Do you bring in that that woman for a tryout? to try to generate interest in your team. Do you keep her on the team as your 12th woman? Not 12th man, 12th woman. And, je- and try to... You're talking ge- about a different thing here, though. Now because now you're not we're not really talking about whether it could happen. You're saying, would it be good marketing? And I've, I, I mean, I, I, it does... It's, uh, well, no, it's, it's, I would be interested to see if... Uh, I would be interested to see what Maya Moore has to say about this. I would be curious to what her perception of it is. It's the same argument, because you could never do it unless... The player in question was at least good enough that it wasn't a total farce. So, you know, so then it comes down to all right, they're gonna, they need a specific skill. Like you're never gonna centers are out, point guards are out, all that. It would have to be a shooter, have to be somebody who could who could consistently make 23 and 24 foot shots. And she could go out there and do that, and she'd probably get killed on defense. But so do a lot of people. Um, Maybe she wouldn't be the greatest ball handler, but if you put her on a team with a point guard, you wouldn't have to worry about it. As long as they were competent enough that it was justifiable, I think it's a good move. If I was at the GM of the Grizzlies and we were well, okay. headed for you, 20 you, wins, I would do it. What, uh, since you seem to watch, you seem to follow this more than I do, what do you, uh, if, we, if we looked at uh, the, 10 best, the 10 best three-point shooters uh, in the college women's game, Right. What do they shoot? Now they're shooting from a slightly shorter line, but what percentage are they shooting? Joe Mead, can you look this up? Yeah, I'm here. All right. I you can think about for somebody what you're really saying, and okay, you're giving the most realistic scenario, yeah. which is that that there is a, a player whose skill at a specific task is so high that it sort of makes up for everything else. Yeah, okay. you're basically it's Anthony so Morrow what do, with what does with someone breast. need to shoot from 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 the perimeter to compensate for this idea that they probably can't physically match up with anyone on defense, even if they're a great athlete, even if they're the superior woman, if they're a Marion Jones type athlete. You know, Marion Jones can't cover people in the NBA. I would say they'd have to shoot at least 45% from three. I would think it would have to be higher. I would think there would be, got, there would, there's a, probably a ton of men right now who, if all they had to do was shoot threes, could probably shoot nearly 50% on threes, but in every other aspect would be so exploited. 50s only would... happened a couple times in the history of the league. No, I, well, I know that. realistic. What? 45%, I think, is a realistic... Is a realistic number for a player who's really playing. I'm saying you're saying a guy or a person, any individual, and you're almost saying the other aspects of the game we can discount because they're going to be valuable enough just to do this. Well, maybe well, I you bet put. There's, a lot, there's probably standing jump shooters at Division two schools who, if if they were, you know, if are are good enough to compete at the Division two level, simply because if they are open, um, you know, uh, I mean, I, I feel like when I watched Division two basketball in college, there were guys who could shoot the perimeter shot as well as anybody I'd seen at any level, pro or otherwise, but. There was no aspect of their game that would translate besides that one. But those was, people aren't selling me tickets. I, but here, you talking about? I thought we were talking about whether it could happen. Now you're saying about whether somebody could do it's it. It's the I mean, same argument. Whether it will no, happen ties into argument. it is. How whether is it the same will, argument? Whether it will happen hinges on whether a team is desperate enough from a marketing standpoint and a ticket standpoint to try it. That's how it'll happen. So you're saying that say anything Bill Vick did that validates the fact that it could happen. That's I'm putting, saying that if... Putting a midget, in, uh, uh, having a midget back, that, that validates the fact that, oh, midgets can play in Major League Baseball. I it think happens. that's a totally different argument. 
No, okay. it's, the, it's the identical it's argument to what you're making. Well, what about that? basically the, saying that if you were the Grizzlies and you, you can't sell tickets and you can find somebody with one skill in the same way that a very small man is hard to pitch to, that if you can yeah. find a woman with this one skill that makes it not a laughing stock necessarily to right. do this, that's not, that's, that's not arguing that, that it can really happen. You're saying that someone can do it. You know I'm, saying, I'm saying it's like no, no. You put I, I thought we were talking about. I thought we were talking about is is it possible? Because we were ta- initially we started talking about improvements in the women's game, and right. I thought what you were arguing is that in 20 years you can see a situation where the absolute best college women's basketball player would have a chance to stick on an NBA team for a yes. week. Yes. Because they would be just good enough to be able to hang from a talent standpoint if they had that one elite skill, and because. You know, the way sports are going and the, and how hard it's become to sell tickets and how hard it's become to generate interest, you might see a team take a chance. Will it work? I don't know. But let's say you have Maya Moore, who's 15% better than the Maya Moore we have now. Maya, Maya Moore 2.0, 11 years from now, and she's just a dead eye. She makes everything. She's competent enough athletically, so it wouldn't be a total farce. You could throw her in a zone. You could have a center protect her. I think we're going to see a team try it. I really do. It's going to happen. So, Bill, we got the uh, the top 32 women this year all shot over 40%. Okay, but who had who had somebody who had a lot of attempts? Give us a percentage. So, Jeanette Polin was the point guard for Stanford. Yeah. So, conceivably, she can handle the ball a little bit. She's six one senior. Mm-hmm. She was 40.4%. She had 88 makes in 218 attempts. That's one of the most attempts. Smaller distance. She's at, she's at 40.4%, 19 feet, 9 inches from the line with a yeah, smaller not, ball at 6 foot 1. It would so really have to be. How much is that person going to have to improve to be in a, you know, if she's, be tough. You know, if she's four, you know, 4 more inches, say she's 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and she shoots... Well, 10% better, that would be pretty dramatic. It's not going to be her. What, what were my Morris stats, Joe? I'll have to look them up. She wasn't in the top 50, so she's at least under 38%. Maya Moore, they're down like six or seven in the last two minutes, and she made like an NBA bomb. And I was like, that that's the whole reason I thought. I was like, oh, my God, that was, that was an NBA shot. It made me wonder, like, at some point, are we going to see this? And I wonder just physiologically if... if 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 it's possible, because I do think women have a lower center of gravity, and you, you know there there would be some sort of athletic thing that would need to happen. In her career, she shot forty percent. This year, she was just about at thirty eight percent. It's interesting. Do you think lower center of gravity is the is the the, the difference here? Well, there's something's going on that makes them. To, you know, every year there somebody will write some feature about women's basketball players. I used to make fun of this on my old website. It was like every year somebody would write this feature, like nobody had ever thought of it before. But for whatever reason, women's at, female athletes they uh, they tear their ACLs and they have more knee problems than male athletes. And there's all these stats that back it up. Um, and it's something to do with. I think it's a combo of lower center of gravity and just the way their knees are built. I don't know. I don't think they've ever totally figured it out. But you know, I, I some, don't know. I, it's, it's interesting. I did not. Uh, I'm not aware of these uh, studies. Well, hold on. Quick, quick flip on this discussion for a second. Okay. Because I, I do think we're entering a decade where GMs are going to have to really start taking some chances. You know, al- along the lines of. A woman is our 12th man, and occasionally she can come in in garbage time and make some threes and things like that. Don't you feel like if, like, let's say you're running the Timberwolves. David Kahn just got fired. It's two years from now. You don't get Rubio. Kevin Love just signed with another team as a free agent. You're going to be a lottery team for the next five years again. Don't, wouldn't you start taking chances beyond what we've seen? Isn't your job to sell tickets and to get people to come to your building? Like you mentioned Bo Vec before. Why why aren't more teams thinking that way? Well, I I think that in my mind, I don't know if, if, if what Bill Vec did was... Uh, well, you're against I, it morally. Well, <laughs> I, it, 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 to me, it, it, this is just... What, what, what you're talking about is... A problem that 
Yeah, I mean, it's just it sort of reflects the problem of the relationship of money and sports, where we where, where this discussion is is something that that one has to consider. What do you do to sell tickets uh, if you're a general manager who's, in my mind, his job is to build a successful basketball team? And what you're saying basically is, what would what does one have to do outside of the game to get you know attract people to watch it? And I I just think you know the thing if you really want to do is lower ticket prices. But they won't do that because the amount of money they have to pay the players and the amount of money that owners want to make is obscene. All right, but that's out. So we, you're saying we, within, if we're going to continue continue raising ticket prices, continue doing all the, you know, what, what would I do if I was the GM of the Timberwolves to generate more interest in the team? Well, this uh, this goes to a discussion Gladwell and, I had, Gladwell and I had at the Technology Summit. Gladwell is a big proponent of, he thinks that, Tickets should just be lowered completely, and that way it would be more fun to go to the games. You'd have more fans. Anybody would be able to get in. I, I don't totally believe that. Like he, he uses the example of college basketball. They have the waiting lists. You know, there's no there's no hierarchy of ticket prices. I don't think that's realistic, but I do think you could have a combo of, you know, the, the, where you want to sit on a basketball court is between the lines, and people are always going to want to be courtside. They're always going to want to be in the first 10 or 12 rows between the baskets. I think you could sell those seats at whatever price you want. And then you have your suites on the bottom row. Other than that, I would make everything 10 bucks or 5 bucks or whatever. I, my goal at that point would be to just get those people in and, and buying food and drinks. And, you know, this goes into a whole other thing. Of the, another thing I've talked about is what's the ideal size for a basketball stadium heading in, you know, what's the next state-of-the-art stadium going to look like? And, Part of me wonders if it's going to be a 10,000 seat stadium. You know, like if you if you're in Seattle and you're building that new stadium, why does it have to be 18,000 seats? Why can't it be 10? Why can't you just concentrate on between the baskets and then, you know, everything else is 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 supply and demand basically. Well, the Minnesota Twins sort of did that with their new stadium. They did, and it was smart. Relatively small stadium, and that was a smart move. Um, Well, why not for basketball? I mean, I I would agree with you. I would I I wish that they played the Final Four in really small arenas. I wish they played at places like you know like Cameron State. I think that would be more interesting to watch. Um, and I, like, and also it hurts the game. I think I think when you have especially dome. I mean, there's been. I just think it's really hard to shoot in a dome and eighty thousand people or whatever it is. And I, I don't know. It's, you you re- you can pull it off if you have the Celtics and the Lakers, but. Well, and also, I, I kind of feel the shooting in the dome is a somewhat little overrated quality that people are talking about just because the team shot so bad on Monday. It is definitely higher to shoot in a dome. There's no question about that. But, A, it doesn't take long to get comfortable there. You don't have to shoot many times. A few hours shooting in a dome, you get used to the conditions. And, B, a lot of these kids grow up playing outside. That's the ultimate dome. Right. So this idea that somehow a dome is is, is so radically different because – there's all this space above you, and so I mean that's you know if you shoot in a playground, it's like being in a dome. All right, let's say Michael Jordan hires you as, as the new GM of the Charlotte Bobcats. You basically have no good players. You're in a market that has Duke and North Carolina and uh, University of North Carolina. You are going to have trouble attracting people over the course of the next decade. You have no franchise player. You have really no hope in the East whatsoever because you're in the same conference with the Heat and the Celtics and the Bulls. What do you do when you're the GM? Do you do you feel an obligation to come up with really creative ways to bring people into the arena? I guess my philosophy, if I was being interviewed for this job, which especially the way you described it, it doesn't seem like a very desirable job. But let's say I wanted it. But you're you're. It's yeah. no less desirable than than getting the VCU job and trying to turn that program around. I mean, your goal is to turn this team around, get it some attention, and then parlay that into the Lakers GM job or something. Well, boy, I'm a real craven individual, aren't I? Um, uh, Let's see. My my thinking would be that uh, people are fickle. People like winning. The best philosophy, the safest philosophy, would not be a bunch of short-term decisions like what can we make people do to come in in November or the first season I take the job. But 
I would take whatever I thought were the most reasonable steps to building a winning team over a manner of years, and there would be some risk involved because maybe it doesn't work. But I think that that would be if – if even if I was just from a purely practical objective, because you can't really guess what people are going to find to be entertaining. It just doesn't work. But we know that they are entertained by successful basketball teams. Right. So what I would say, if, when I would tell Michael Jordan, is what I'm going to do here is the same thing I would do if I was the GM in New York or in Dallas or in Houston or whatever, which is to build a competitive team. Okay, but... That's not a very interesting answer, but that's what I would do, you know? Yeah, I wouldn't give you the job. Because uh, what, what would you do? I would shake I, your I hand like and... that's th- the question you're waiting for me to ask. What would no, you I was... I, I was more what, should... what would you do in this situation? I'm curious. I was more interested in what you would do, to be honest. I know what well, I would I'm not do. Saying that you were, I'm not saying that you were trying to get me to ask you that, but I sense you have an idea in your head if you were asking the question. No. That's, I was more interested in what you were going to do. But well, since you asked, um, I mean, I've written some of this stuff, but I, I think your goals are going to change whether you're a small market team or a big market team. If you're a small market team, I think there's only one way to play it. You just basically copy what Sam Presti did. And you try to keep your cap space alive. You try to build through the lottery. You try to bottom out. You try to. You hope that you get lucky with Durant, Westbrook, or whomever. And in the meantime, you don't. You don't waste your time and your cap space buying these short-term guys and tying it up because the way the league works is every year teams want to dump so and so, or they want to get into the luxury tax, or they need to clear cap space for this guy. And you want to have the cap space open to say, all right, we'll take that guy. But because we're taking that guy, you also have to give us your number one pick and this guy. And that's – he kind of slowly build assets. And I think he's done the best job of that. So that that would be part one. And then part two, in the meantime, because it's kind of a crappy thing to do to your fans to say, we're going to bottom out. This is the only way we can be good. I think you lower your ticket prices in the in the upper bowl. I think you come up with all kinds of creative ways to get them involved. I mean, if I was running a really crappy team – and it's what is it? Mar? It's April right now, or there's two weeks, three weeks to go in the season. I would have fan tryouts for my fifteenth band. Why not have a whole tryout thing? Get people excited. Oh, we picked this guy. Like basically try to do Invincible with Mark Wahlberg, whatever that movie was. Try, try to find somebody in your city that could be the fiftieth band in the team and get a ten day contract. These are the things that NBA teams don't think about. I don't know why. All you're trying to do is generate interest. Yeah, I mean, you know you. You like marketing. You're interested in marketing. You're you're always intrigued by also like the, the trade machine and the cap stuff. Do you, for you though, would you say that obviously the, the the main reason you like sports is is still the games and the players? Yes. But would you say a chunk of your personal interest is now almost built around the business of sport, particularly in the NBA? You seem to know more about cap space and what trades are possible and all that stuff than anyone I've ever met. So, and, I, and I'm curious if now, for you, it's almost like a second sport. Well, I do think that's – I think with the NBA in particular, it's become a second sport. And I think it's the best reason why it's become a 12-month sport. It's a sport that the season ends and it goes into the draft. Everybody spends three weeks talking about the draft. The draft ends. Now we're heading into free agency. Free agency lasts – Basically, all the way through August, everyone's talking about that. What do they do? What trades are coming? Well, who spent their their cap space on what? And then all of a sudden, the season's ready to start, and it's effectively a twelve month season now. The thing, the part that I I'm con- always confused by with the NBA is why the teams don't try to figure out how to generate interest more. Like why why they're so predictable? I mean, even you go to I've been to. I think seven different NBA arenas this year. Every arena you go to now has the two-minute intro video of the starters. You know that whole thing? They introduce mm-hmm. the opposing team. That's the starters. And it's basically the same video in every city. Like, it's almost like like they cut these little, you know, it's like you cut a cookie tray and all the cookies look the same. Mm-hmm. Same video, just the players are different. And then it always ends with the star of the team screaming, like, let me hear it! And then the game starts. And... Why would you want to be like the other teams? I would think well, if you okay, ran a team, you'd want to stand out. Lot, there's not a lot of people who are going to 10 or 15 NBA cities a season to watch games. No, but they, you, that's a I different... Mean, unless you work in the media, the idea of like, ah, I'm just going to check out a game in Dallas, like, you do that all the time. That's so a different argument. My argument is, 
if but you're how, how does anyone how does the average person know that every stadium is the same like that I'm if saying if you're one of the 30 teams why do you want to do everything the other 29 teams are doing this is why I like Cuban I didn't totally agree with what he did, what he said this week about banning internet reporters or what value they have or stuff like that but at least he thinks about this stuff at least he has opinions you know, at least he's constantly thinking of different ways to make his fan experience better. I think he's the best owner in the league with that. He Every month that goes by, he's thinking of a different way to, to get people talking about his team. And I just think that's your obligation if you own a team or if you're running it. You well, don't agree. You are you sort of are the, the fan's proponent. You're, all, you're concerned with the position of the fan. And I, I think that Cuban is as well. I mean, I... I don't know. I, I, I tend to find all of these things that these ideas you're bringing up, to me those are sort of distractions. Like nothing drives – one of the things I hate about the NBA is that if I'm watching a, a game on – this doesn't seem to happen as much with a nationally televised games like on, on ABC or TNT, although it still does in some places. When like they play music during the game. Yeah, I, I hate that so maddening why they think anybody wants to hear pop music during the basketball game. I just think that is ridiculous. But the Knicks last week against the Nets played some weird heavy bass sound effect. There's a like, boom, 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 and it kind of felt like uh, like some 70s TV show where, where the, the character has been drugged and they make those weird sound effect music. So it almost seemed like a competitive advantage for the Knicks to play that song when the Knicks had the ball. I hate it. I hate that stuff. I mean, I guess my position on this, and we here's another thing that we differ on, I suppose, is that I, I just I feel like the problem with sports leagues, and this is a, this is totally a reflection of when they realized how much money was available, but fundamentally the problem with the NBA, with the NFL, with you know. It's this idea that they need to expand to their fan base to people who don't really like the sport. And that's when all of this crap gets involved. This mm-hmm. idea that somehow watching a basketball game is not interesting enough for uh, a lot of people. That, that, that there's, if we're going to have a really wide audience, we need to appeal basically to people who don't like the game. And any time any product tries that, whether it's basketball, whether it's music, whether it's film... Anything like that, when the idea, whether it's religion, when the idea becomes that for this to be successful, we need to appeal to people who don't really care, it gets worse. And you know, the NBA is too concerned about people who don't really like pro basketball. It was like, you know, when the, um, there was all that, that people freaked out when, you know, Jordan retired the second time. Right. And there was this idea that there was no interest in the league now and that ratings are down and all these things. And it was because the people they were losing were not people who liked basketball. They liked Michael Jordan, the persona of this guy. And I'm, I, don't, I, I, I wish leagues were less interested in people who were uninterested in the league. But they well, see that you know if you, if you can get a guy to go to the game and also bring his wife and two kids even though the, you know three of the four people in that car driving to the arena would rather be doing something else, because they're charging those people 80 bucks to get in or whatever, it's like, well, let's find ways to do that. So let's play music during the game, and let's have the cheerleaders shoot those T-shirt guns into the audience and all that stuff, because that's going to make a nine-year-old kid who'd rather look at his phone want to go to this basketball game. Yeah, but you know what, though? I was on your side until I took my daughter to a couple Clipper games this year. This is going to make you sad, but guess what her favorite parts were? Um, let me guess. Uh, I would guess going to the concession stand would be one. Yep. And uh, probably the the dancers. Dancers, yep. And um, <laughs> the pregame intro with the scoreboard with the, when the lights went out and they played the video. Love that. Big fan. Kiss cam. Your daughter's like six, right? She's five. She was five, probably five and a half, or a little after that when we went to the two clip games. Why do you want to bring a five and a half year old girl to a basketball game? I don't get that. I don't understand that. It was like my friend the other day. My friend went to see Black Swan, and somebody brought their like. (laughs) That's totally different. Give me a break. Why are you bringing a five year old kid to an adult event? Well, it's not an adult event. There's a lot of kids. Well, it fundamentally is an adult event. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to defend this in a couple ways. One, it's fun to spend time with my daughter. It's three hours that we're hanging out. Two, yeah, stay she, home. Play she with likes, dolls and like build a 
blog house or something. Oh, Why my would you, God. You know? <laughs> oh, boy. So she really likes basketball, and she actually watched the whole game and, like, had opinions on it. And, what like, were her she, opinions? Well, she could tell that Blake Griffin was really fun to watch, and she wanted him to get the ball and score. She could tell she liked. Well, Baron was on the team. You don't think that maybe she was reacting to the fact that you're enthused about that, and she takes her cues from her father and realizes that because you care about this guy, if she gets excited about this guy, it's a way for to connect with you. Well, what what would be different with that and music? Like, let's say you had a kid. And you're listening to the Beatles. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to bring him to a Nickelback concert or whatever I'm going to. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think you should. Basketball is fun to bring a kid. My dad brought me to games when I was four. That's one of the reasons I like basketball now. Yeah, that's a, I, that's a good I, example. I feel like I feel like there's a situ, uh, there's an age when I when bringing a kid to a game, uh, it, it becomes totally appropriate. I mean, sports are supposed to be like for people who are 80 or. You don't have kids though. I know, but I know that I know. That I'm going to say that five, kindergarten is the right time. Any time before that is dumb, because in kindergarten they start becoming real people and they and they actually are looking at the experience the right way and asking the right questions and and they can concentrate the whole time and things like that. I mean, you know, as much as I loved sports when I was a little kid, I would still remember that you know I'd watch the NFL today. We'd start watching the game at noon. And by halftime, like, I wanted to go out and play football because I was still mm. fundamentally a little kid. Three hours to sit and watch something, sort of a long, boring time for a kid, no matter what, if it's the circus. No, because in basketball, you break it up. You show up. You get there right on time. You, you Like with my daughter, we'll always leave, like, at the end of the first quarter, and we'll go, like, go to the concession stand or whatever. We'll do that. Halftime is a 15-minute break. And then you don't forget this part. It's exciting for a kid if it's a good game and the crowd's cheering and everybody's applauding and high fiving. Like that was my daughter and I. We went to one close game, and she loved that part. She loved that clapping and doing the defense and things like that. Like she liked that. She had a good time. I wouldn't bring her to a baseball game though. Like I, I just feel like that's where he, I'm basically bringing her somewhere so we can eat and drink. She'll have she want, she's not going to care what's going on in the field. Um, it's boring. It's one outside, of those things. At least, though. Huh? At least it's outside. Yeah, I guess it's outside. I think for baseball, the, it the kid has to know what's exactly going what on. I'm saying. Okay, so now that they've the NBA has created a system where uh, there's stuff to occupy the mind of a five and a half year old girl, but there's all these other things that are going on that that she can sort of sit through this experience. Yeah. Um, and. To sit in it, like, what, what would your, what, what's the face value of, of the ticket she was sitting in? Of the seat she was sitting in? <sighs> well, we have season tickets, so it's cheaper. I don't know. It's probably like, uh, somewhere in the, I forget what it is after the season ticket discount, but it's in the 150 to 160 Okay, range. so, the, this, this $150 to, to, to sort of create a, uh, entertainment for somebody who has, to be quite honest, I'm, no relationship to pro basketball. Like it, 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 it wouldn't. It, it could have been the Clippers. It could have been anybody. It could have been animals. But I have good seats, though. I mean, okay. we could have but, sat but in the upper saying, deck for no, ten bucks. Essentially, you are bankrolling uh, this this massive, massive uh, windfall that has created the, that makes this super multi million dollar league, right? And in order to keep that going, in order to keep the league sort of operating in this super high financial uh, tier, they've got to find. Um, Tickets got to be as high as that, one hundred and fifty dollars, well, and they, they have to keep perpetuating interest in the non-fan. And this is where all these other weird things come out. And then there's so much money involved. This goes back to our original argument of why it's impossible to create an incentive for a kid to stay in college because there's so much money to be made playing pro basketball because they're dealing in this completely constructed, fabricated financial world. But here's the part you're missing. If they can get the money that they can get for the good seats, they should get what what they can charge. And event, and they're hitting a tipping point now where they're going to start losing fans because the tickets are too high. Where they're losing the fans already is in the upper deck and the the seats in the corners and things like that. And that's like you look at what happened with the Indians this week. What was it? Ninety five hundred people for the Red Sox game last night. We're taping this on a Wednesday. Um, the some of these sports are now hitting a tipping point with the fans, and that's where things are going to have to change. And I think that's what this decade is going to be about. It's going to be about 
uh, all of the leagues reconfiguring how they do their tickets. And ironically, the one sport that probably won't have to reconfigure at all is hockey. Because it seems like hockey fans are either all in or they or you're casual. And there's no well, in between. It's, it's a, it, they've, they've, against their will, they've been able to keep that system smaller. I'm yes. sure if they could have expanded in the way the NFL and the NBA would have, they would have. But there was a limit. There was a limit in interest. There's certain parts of the country that just don't follow hockey. It's just it's a it's a it's a smaller world. The players make less money. There's less money to be made, and that has probably made it, you know a, a more kind of contained thing. They had, now, but they had their own problems, of course, with television and all these things. I mean, they. I, I don't know who. Uh, I don't know if, if like the NBA would like to be hockey now. I'm sure they would not. But well, I think. The lesson of what happened with hockey was that they basically had to go away to figure out the right system. I mean, what were they gone for? A year and a half? I Two don't years? Know. I can't even remember what the know. exact. I mean, they definitely they missed the whole season, mm-hmm. but they came back with a system that finally made a little bit of sense. Now, you know, I don't think they should get praised for that because the system that they had created was so bad that they had to disappear for a year and a half. But um, I think kind of headed that way toward basketball because the guys make too much money. I wrote about it last week about it's the middle class, I think, that's killing the league. It's the guys that don't sell a ticket and are pretty much interchangeable, making 30 to $50 million a year. That's what's sinking the league. And that's ultimately why they have to keep raising the ticket prices. I'm yeah, fine well, with you're, Kobe you're making... You're saying that the owners should charge whatever they can get for tickets, if they can get one hundred and fifty dollars, that's what they should charge. If Bo Outlaw can get his money, you got. I'm sure you'd say he should get as much as he can. Yeah. You know, I'm saying it's 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 very it's, it's a very kind of common argument to always be like, well, there's too much money involved, but everybody should get as much as they can get because everyone feels that way about themselves. Well, I don't I don't agree with that though because I think the leagues have some responsibility to keep. Um, at least a lot of the ticket prices under a certain threshold so that fans this don't is, feel excluded. This is on tape. Like two minutes ago, you said they should get what they can. They should charge what they can. For the for the good seats. For the seats, you know, between the baskets up to 12 rows. I'm saying they need to start worrying about the upper decks because they just can't get people to come there anymore. And that's why they have these four-for-one deals and come to a game and you get three free hot dogs. Like that's the stuff they're resorting to now because – they're they're not getting those people anymore. Because if you're if you're a dad with two kids and a wife and you want to go to a game, and you don't have a lot of money. You're driving in. You got to worry about parking. You got to worry about your four tickets. Like, uh, why not just stay home at that point? It's a pain in the ass. So it is, it's, it's weird weird problems though. I mean, like uh, you know, what would it have cost to buy pretty much any team in the NBA outside of? you know, Boston and maybe the Lakers in, in 1977 or 1978. What yeah, would the I mean, franchise would have cost? The Clippers, I think, in 19... Sterling bought them in, I think, 79, 12 million in San I, Diego. I, yeah, it, it, I, I thought it was even maybe a little less than that. Cause was, wasn't he buying them and moving them? It was like you could have... It, it just seems like, a, like the NBA has all these problems now, but in some ways they're like desirable problems. They're really kind of dealing with the problem of having uh, went from being this league that couldn't get on prime time for the finals to having so much money that there's now this sense that you know maybe we have finally get you know I didn't I grew up always under the impression that player salaries would just always go up. I never thought there would be a point when it would be like we, would cap we out. can't pay these guys and that's going to happen. It's not a question of what they make for one given season. It's a question of these the length of the contracts is their big thing, and that's the thing that they're just going to fight tooth and nail on. They don't want to give out contracts that are longer than four years anymore. And if you look at just the last 15 years, the contracts that have killed teams are the contracts, the year five and year six of a terrible deal. That's just what, like, look at that Richard Lewis-Gilbert Arena trade. That those were two contracts that the teams literally didn't know what to do with. And it was so much money, um, you know, it's crippling. So they need to figure that out. I love the fact that you're, you're, you, you were against me taking my daughter to two Clipper games. I think well, that's the biggest revelation in the history of the podcast. <laughs> you really need to have kids. I demand that you have kids. So I can take them to Knicks games? I just think so you, you have a different appreciation. Appreciation. 
It's fun to hang out with your kid. Yeah, I know, I know, but you don't need to go out in public to do it, Bill. You can hang out with your kid in the house. Why don't you do things she wants to do? She did want to go. That's why I took her. I didn't want to take her. All the things, if if, if we went to your daughter right now, if I got off the phone and could somehow find your daughter, and I was like, I wish she was here. spend three hours with your dad today. What do you want to do? Do you think one of them might be like, oh, man, I'd like to check out that last Clippers game? I don't I don't think that would be her reaction. Now, see, this is, how, this is where your lack of kid experience is really showing. Because I'll go to a Clipper game. My daughter will be like, where are you going? I'm going to a Clipper game. Why don't I get to go to a Clipper game? That's how they think. Yeah, I know, but Bill, if you were kids. saying. Okay, I'll, I'll take you. Feel, if you said, I'm going to a funeral, she would go, why don't I get to go to the funeral? It's that she, she, I, I think that you're trying to convince yourself to make up for the fact that you feel a little weird about bringing a five-and-a-half-year-old girl to an NBA game because you want to see it. I don't even feel 1% weird. I feel 0% weird. I think she had fun. What, what, why would I feel weird about that? We do all kinds of things. You need to have a kid. You'll understand. At some point, you're going to understand when you're, when you're torturing your kid and making them listen to Led Zeppelin 4 over and over again. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Let's, uh, we'll continue this either next week or the week after because I have to go. Okay. Chuck Klosterman, sports agnostic, parent atheist, parent, sports parent atheist. Um, we we have our uh, we have our website. It's launching somewhere between June of this year and uh, 2017. It'll be somewhere <laughs> in that window. We'll is see. There, but is there going to be a big release about everyone involved now? Or are we still waiting on that? Uh, probably, hopefully, next week or the week after or something, or who knows. But we're hoping that uh, we're hoping relatively soon we'll be ready in the same place together. Yes. Hey, before we go, I just wanted to mention I had this earlier. You're doing. You're talking about. Do freshmen work what the one and dones in college basketball? Yeah. The 2003 title game, Carmelo's championship year. Oh. Not, not only did they have Carmelo, but also Jerry McNamara was a freshman who started. Mm. And their sixth man was Billy Edelin, who might have been a starter, but he was suspended for the first 12 games of the year. Mm. But they were their top three scorers in the championship game, all freshmen. So there it is. There it is. It does work. It does work. Hasn't worked for eight years, but it does work. All right, Chuck, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. the sign off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.